the bomb and what you might not have known about it. My name is William Cornwell, and I am an atomic veteran. I did not serve aboard a vessel that was propelled by atomic means, nor have I uh, served uh, many years in an atomic occupation. I am ex-Navy, and I gained my license, you might say, to wear the patch of an atomic veteran by spending two weeks in the desert in, you might say, what was the center of the mining for atomic ore uh, used in the making of uranium. And my one hour flying over ground zero, which will be explained to you in a few more minutes. The presentation is on the atomic bomb, its ramifications as far as humanity is concerned, and it is a history lesson. As all lessons have tests, I might say that if you are witnessing this presentation, you have not only taken the test, but you evidently have passed it. During President Roosevelt's last term of office, Roosevelt got his OSS chief to smuggle hundreds of bags of mine ore from the African continent. The mineral, being uraninite, is an ore that produces uranium. Roosevelt was on a tip from Einstein that if an atom could be split, a very great deal of energy would be produced. And if it could be prolonged, it could produce an effect that would be a 100 time more efficient than that many bombs dropped. The president called his secret operation the Manhattan Project. So secret, in fact, the vice president, Harry Truman, had no idea if it existed. When Truman became president of the United States, General Leslie Groves, the head of the unit to produce the uranium, told President Truman about the bomb for the first time. We all know what happened shortly after Truman digested that news. In today's vernacular, those first generation bombs were very dirty, as were all the atom bomb testing done in New Mexico in those days. After the bombs decimated Japan into surrender, Truman set in motion a commission, the Atomic Energy Commission, or AEC, to find out exactly what we had really unleashed. In 1949, the AEC in Washington Los Alamos and Sandia Laboratories of New Mexico formed the nucleus of the official testing unit of all atomic devices existing or proposed. Testing began in 1950 at Nellis Air Force Base 
in western Nevada in their armament testing area on base, officially becoming the Nevada Test Site, or NTS. Tests continued in the South Pacific through 1962. These pictures depict some of the explosive tests that were conducted during that period of time with the series name first and the test name second. When the testing had started, some tests required an airdrop, which only the Air Force could provide with proficiency gained from the previous six years. The Navy Department, not being happy about the Air Force's favor with congressional budgeting over their bomb delivery system, wanted a plane designed that could not only deploy an atomic device anywhere in the world, but do it on and off a carrier. That plane, a North American Aviation AJ-1 Savage, was produced. It contained all the bells and whistles necessary to carry at that period of time devices the sizes and characteristics of the fat man and little boy bombs. It was delivered to Composite Squadron 5, or VC-5, at NAS Patuxent River, Maryland for shakedown and a carrier qualification. Not too long after its arrival, it proved impractical for VC-5 to provide the necessary appraisal the Navy Department so quickly needed. Hence, VC-6 was formed for that sole purpose. Composite Squadron 6 was created in 1951. The squadron not only provided the proof the Navy needed, but filled the actual requirement for supplying the service. Later in 1952, I received orders to report to VC-6 at a Naval Air Station, NAS, North Island, San Diego, California, as an electronic technician radio man, AT-3. After a few months of OJT, I volunteered to become the third man of a three-man crew. In the spring of 1953, I joined with Lieutenant Edward A. Decker, driver or pilot, Lieutenant J.G. Jerry Dorn, BN or Bombardier Navigator, and me, IFR, in flight refueling operator, and the Atomic Devices Trigger Installer. When the bomb wasn't in the bomb bay, a very large gas tank was. That made the IFR crewman 
a handy cover story. And at that, this time, our team inherited Nan Fox 8, a much improved version of the original design. It was the AJ-2. It's now January 1955, time to party. In January of 1955, the AEC invited my squadron to a party, a tea party, and it was to be held at the Nevada testing site and the bomb test series was called Teapot. At the time that this test series was made, navigation by aircraft was not done by chance, but with lots of help from special ground facilities designed for that purpose. They were VOR sites, or a very high frequency radio transmitter that provided azimuth information 360 degrees. Also, there are NSME transmitters at these stations that provide distance information. I'm giving you this information to lay the groundwork for describing VC-6's Camp Swampy which became operational in Death Valley. Question arises, what is a Navy camp doing in the desert? Well, to comply with our invitation to party, our planes were to fly from NAS North Island, California to the drop zone a distance of about 325 miles, and return to North Island. Tests were conducted at all times of the day and the night. Daylight navigation is not as nerve-wracking as night because you can get some visuals to confirm your location but nothing can compare to a radio nav aid for more accuracy. However, there were no CAA nav aid stations in the path to the test. The closest CAA nav aid equipment to the test was located at Tonopah, Nevada, roughly 95 miles away from the site and 400 plus miles from North Island. So far, so good. The 400 plus miles involved going to Tonopah were not a problem. The problem came from Tonopah to the site. Test timing was paramount at all times. Enter Camp Swampy. The Navy, never to be stymied for solutions, came up with a satisfactory conclusion by providing its own nav aid facility. Technicians from the squadron with equipment for the installation drove through Death Valley to establish the camp with navigational equipment. Not only were the nav aids made available, but included were accommodations for the inhabitants who were also to operate the systems. Navy know-how, problem solved. VC-6's Camp Swampy, 12 miles from the junction of highways 374 and 95, which was a junction called Beatty, Nevada, and off the road 50 feet, you would have found the squadron's version of a navigational facility, U.S. Navy style.
It contained not only radio communications, which also provided a radio homing beacon, but also visual night beacons of high wattage lamps capable of thousands of watts of brilliant white light. Following were the features and descriptions of the nav aid. It had somewhere the following equipment. One truck, five by eight stake bed, six wheeler, USN. 10, five gallon jerry cans of gasoline, USN. One, 10 kilowatt, 110 volt AC, 240 volt AC, 24 volt DC, Westinghouse generator, USN. One, wood stove, heating, cooking, USN. Three, bags, sleeping. USN, 180 MRIs, United States Marine Corps. MRIs are meals in cans surrounded by carbide pellets and are actuated by including water makes the cans extremely hot and makes the meals inside the cans very palatable. One helium tank full USN. That was to raise the antenna wire attached to a weather balloon. The balloon was up most of the time. The generator furnished lighting for the camp, power for the radio equipment, transceiver and homing signal, and power for the location lamps. When a mission was on and the info was passed from North Island to the camp via low frequency ART-13 at regular check-ins, and the camp would light up if dark and start transmitting the homing signal. Temperatures during the day were high 90s or three digits. Uniform for the day was skivvies and maybe a t-shirt. Sleeping attire consisted of the uniform of the day plus a shirt, plus trousers, plus socks. At night, the drinking water froze. If the mission was called off, liberty was available for all except one. That person had the duty watch. We could go 12 miles east to Beatty for R&R &R, or go west about 15 miles where we were invited to Scotty's Castle to shower and shave. What? Why? Beatty, Nevada was the closest town. One general store, Slim's Place, which was a saloon and food, and a gas station, not much else. One day at the camp, we were invaded. Even in Death Valley, in the middle of nothing, when a vehicle, any vehicle, passes by only 50 feet away from you, you sound general quarters. Well, two vehicles drove by, passed the camp, stopped, backed up, and everyone got out of them. We were informed they were from a San Diego Sunday newspaper heading to Nevada looking into a story for the next Sunday's edition. Well, to a newsman, seeing a gorgeous Navy installation such as ours in the proximity of Death Valley 
knew something good was going to make their day. The picture you see above shows the Newsies filming the heating MRIs we were fixing for a meal. We told them we used the method of pouring water from a canteen around the can's perimeter to activate the carbide. I guess their story and our pictures made the Sunday news that week. We probably were next to the uh, comic section. Members from the squadron rotated routinely through the camp at two-week intervals from January through May of 1955. I spent my two weeks in March at the camp and one day in April flying over ground zero. Now you get to hear the rest of the story. Time 0830 Squadron Ready Room suited up for morning briefing and flying. It was April 15, 1955. Nan Fox 8 was going to Nevada. Lieutenant J.G. Dorn and I didn't know the mission. Lieutenant Decker did. He wasn't talking, at least about where, what, when, and why. The flight to Camp Swampy was uneventful. Turning to 090 degrees at the camp, Jerry and I were then told about the activity expected. Operation. Proceed to NTS to arrive by 1130 hours at Angels 36,000 to await 1145 hours. Test met countdown. Circle ground zero counterclockwise 15 mile radius. Do not look at ground until detonation plus five. Action. When top of cloud pulse passes altitude plus 10, turn into stem and enter. Exit and return NAS North Island direct. My seat faced aft and behind the pilot on the port side of the cockpit. Bombardier navigator seat faced forward and just a little behind pilot. I could look out of my seat and watch the ground go by. All eyes were inside the cockpit. Then everyone's headset heard Countdown beginning 10, da, 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 4, 3, 2, 1, get nation. Several seconds later, my body suddenly sunk a little deeper in my seat. And then I looked. What I saw will remain in memory until I die. The round mushroom cloud, roughly the size from my perspective, of a soccer ball, dirt colored, covered with little patches about two inches square in size, filled with exploding lightning flashes, and they were every color of the rainbow. That cloud was alive. A comment escaped my lips and Ed looked down too. Not to be left out of the surprise party, Jerry came over between us and added some words also. The cloud was still below us 
and from our view, not moving too fast, but it still caused us all to express comments essentially saying, let's get the hell out of Dodge. We did a 270 degree turn, headed for home, and a little over an hour later left Nan Fox 8 for a shower and deported the base saying nothing to each other or anyone else after leaving NTS behind. The next day I expected to hear from the CO about the episode and our refusal to comply. Nothing. Saw Jerry later, ask if anything was said. Nothing. He did say Ed was up boring holes for somebody, and that was all that ever occurred. Maybe others felt it was a bit screwy too. Seeing the bomb firsthand, attending many schools about how to do my job with atomic bombs, has given me a very strong opinion about their destructive nature. I have searched out every source of information I can get, even during the years of sworn silence. When I tell you what has happened to us, you won't believe me. If you were in Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, or New York State. The city of Troy in New York in particular, at any time in the 1950s, depended only on the whim of the wind, you have been affected by fallout. The only question remaining is by how much. During the NTS testing, only the immediate dosages and exposure time were considered in determining which exposure levels were to be labeled the, quote, safe zone, end quote, and this allowed 3.9 to more than 20 rads to be considered safe. But we now know there is another factor to assess. Cumulative effect. I have been captive to thyroid medication daily since 1970. My cancer was surgically removed on June 16 of 1996. Radiation is stored in the body a very, very long time. Now let me give you another surprise, maybe. The scientists from Los Alamos and Sandia knew about this added assessment factor. The test managers were directed to either alter or destroy some reports so as to, quote, to not alarm the populace, end quote. The people of the United States were purposely kept in the dark about one of the most heinous operations ever foisted on them. Government officials used the Cold War 
for the obfuscation. Since the Freedom of Information Act released me from the threat of imprisonment or even death, I've been on a crusade about this period of history. I want to tell the whole United States citizenry that the soil of the United States and the territories in the South Pacific have received the delivery of the atomic and hydrogen bombs in the past years of more than 500 devices. It seems that no one cares but me, but now maybe the If the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Those were the words of J. Robert Oppenheimer in 1945 after the Trinity atom bomb test, the first ever nuclear test.